Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Man, I feel a little close to you guys. I'm going to take a step back just a moment. All right. So uh, my name's Aaron Espinoza, and I'm the Library and Observatory, Observatory Director. And I just want to say thank you all for coming today. Um, we have a great three-part series uh, with Chef Shannon. Who has already been to some of Chef Shannon's lectures? Ooh, see, you're getting that following, Chef. Um, so when we started this program uh, several years ago, Chef Shannon's like, are they really going to want to come? And we're like, absolutely. The one thing that I know you all want to do is taste the food, and unfortunately we can't do that. Um, somehow I will work with city attorneys and things of that, and hopefully in the future we will be able to do that. But until then, you're going to get to smell amazing things. You're going to get to learn from Chef Shannon. Uh, you have the... Uh, uh, recipes, if you do not, they're on the stand over here. Um, I would like to take a moment and thank uh, Gerald and Lori Ernst for sponsoring this three-part series, so please give them a round of applause. <laughs> if you have not already, please pick up our program guide. Um, you will see that we have programming almost every day of the week. Um, for those of you that were here on uh, Saturday for our artist studio tour, uh, we had a great artist studio tour. 
Last night, we had a reception for our Ranch Mirage 50th anniversary book launch. Today, we have Chef Shannon. Tomorrow, we have music. And on Thursday, we have a writer series event uh, with Neil King Jr. So we are trying to get programming for everyone. So I hope to see more familiar faces around. Um, all of this is sponsored by the Ranch Mirage Library and Observatory Foundation. It is with their support from you as donors that help us do all these amazing things. So I just want to say thank you to those that have donated. And for those of you who have not, you're still here enjoying it for free. So thank you for coming today. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Chef Shannon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you, Aaron. And thank you, everybody that's here today. Haven't been here since December, so I'm feeling a little rusty. So bear with me. <laughs> Today's class is, um, we're going to be working with one of my favorite food items to work with, mushrooms. Um, thanks to a local mushroom grower, we have a beautiful display up here. And um, I hope you all, at some point, come and take a closer look at the mushrooms. Um, there's really, it's just really neat to see how they grow. Um, so, with that said, let's get started. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about are marinated mushrooms. Now, I thought it would be pretty boring to just mix a bowl of uh, marinade together um, for you. So I did this ahead of time. Um, but these are a wonderful way to um, have something nutritious, delicious, just ready to go in the fridge. These will last about a week when you make them. And there are a couple of stars in the recipe. One is dried tarragon. If you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to give it a try. It's very unique. Um, it has a wonderful flavor that um, can enhance anything. Tarragon. Um, and by the way, if any of you shop at Whole Foods, they have these great little green eco-friendly boxes. And they're just a small amount of the different spices. And it's a great way to try something if you're not quite sure you're going to like it. It's not a huge investment, two or three dollars, and you can try a huge variety of spices. So that's where this one's from. The other star of the show in the um, marinated mushrooms is the recipe I gave you calls for uh, chili flakes. And you can go ahead and use the traditional ones that most of us have in our pantry. But um, the Korean chili flakes make it so much better. The Korean chili flakes, the gochugaru, they, um, they're seedless. So the, the ones that we normally buy here in the US are full of seeds. The seeds never soften. They're not pleasant to bite down on. They do make um, a punch of spicy flavor. but. This is just the ground chili itself and not the seeds. So, and it also has a slightly smoky aftertaste to it. So I encourage you to get one of these for your cupboard if you like a little bit of spice and uh, don't want the seeds. But uh, marinated mushrooms. It is, but if you don't like a lot of spice, just use a little bit. Uh, many places, but yes, they do carry it at Whole, Food, Whole Foods. And there are several brands, but this brand, it's called Mother-in-Laws. They make uh, several things, um, and uh, the Gochugaru as well. I always like to tell you guys about neat products I find or interesting things. Um, for those of you trying to use less salt, have you ever tried the potassium salt? Not everybody can take it because certain medications don't agree with it, so check with your doctor if you want to give it a try. But it tastes exactly like salt. It's potassium chloride instead of um, sodium chloride. It tastes exactly like salt. You use it the same measurements that you would with regular salt, and it does not affect your body. It does not raise your blood pressure. Just something, something to think about. <laughs> um, well, there's several, several brands of it. 
this one is no salt, um, sodium-free salt alternative, but it's just 100% um, potassium chloride. Um, you can find it just about everywhere. I noticed that even Morton from Morton Salt, um, they have a version. So it's pretty easy to find, and it's not priced that much differently than regular salt. So there you go. I will put these over here, so if anybody wants to check out these great chili flakes later, you're welcome to look at them. So let's get started with something a little more interesting. So the next one, I'm, I'm, I'll go in order today. I'll do the forest scallops with polenta. So who likes my name? I was so proud of myself for coming up with a forest scallop. It's a name. <laughs> this one. So what do I list first there? Okay, so prepping the mushrooms. So there are a lot of different methods for preparing mushrooms. One of the things that I hear a lot from people is that they say they don't have much flavor, they don't have enough flavor. Um, so this method is really good for infusing the mushroom with some extra flavor. Um, I'm using the king oyster mushrooms for this dish. And this is a beautiful king oyster. And we also have a, a forest of them over here. <laughs> but um, what you're going to do is cut this into little scallop-like pieces, and then you're going to actually cook it in a very flavorful uh, broth. And what that will do is just infuse that mushroom with all of the flavor of the broth. So I've cooked some ahead of time, um, but I'll show you how to do it. Super easy. You can just take the cap off and use it for something else. And then you're going to use the stem and just cut it down into little, little pieces that resemble a scallop. And then what I do is I just take the knife and I make a little grid pattern on each end of it. I'm only cutting just a very, you know, just a very shallow cut. And I go ahead and do it on both sides. And then when it cooks, you'll be able to see that little grid pattern on it, and they look really pretty. So that's all there is to it. So I have some that I cooked um, ahead of time, and then we're going to finish them here. I'm going to use some avocado oil to fry these until they're golden brown on each side. So you'll notice that the um, broth that these are cooked in, um, the first thing I cook in there is the corn. And corn on the cob is not in season right now, um, but this dish really, really needs the corn. So I decided to um, buy frozen corn on the cob because that was the only way I could get sort of fresh corn for this dish. So the star of the broth, is, well, two things. I have some bouillon cubes, which um, this one I really like. It's called Not Chicken. Um, pretty easy to find. And so I use a combination of the bouillon cubes, and then some traditional seafood seasoning, Old Bay. Are you guys familiar with Old Bay? Yeah. yeah. It's been around a long time. Um, it's traditionally used with seafood. Um, 
I was just, uh, I was looking at the, the recipe on the back here. Um, you make the broth and then you add 12 live crabs. I'm glad I'm a vegan, so. <laughs> but um, you don't have to use it on live crabs. It's um, got a fabulous flavor. The base of it is celery salt. So it adds um, a great flavor to this dish. So you have that nice um, fl flavorful broth and you cook the corn in it so the corn gets infused with the flavor. The mushrooms get infused. And then we will just cook these. I don't think my oil is quite hot enough. Oh, it is. My green pan. Oh, you're <laughs> you've been here before. Um, it's just taking a little break. <laughs> yeah, the green one kind of matched the theme, didn't it? But this one's easier to clean. All right. So I'm going to try and get a nice brown, crusty sear on these. So like with anything else, you don't want to move them around. Um, I'm just going to let them sit where they landed, and then they'll loosen a little bit um, as they start to crisp up. So in the meantime, what we can do is prep our toppings for the dish. So I'm going to use the corn, and unfortunately, when you buy frozen corn, it turns out they cut the cobs in half. Not sure why. But um, this is how it came. And then I'm going to take my knife and I'm going to shave the sides of the corn. And I'm going to get it pretty close to the cob because my hope is that I can get the, um, the strip of corn to kind of hold together. Like so. Uh, it's actually already cooked. I cooked it in the, she was asking if it would hold together when it's cooked, but it's already cooked. We cooked it in the broth before we put the mushrooms in it. But these beautiful strips are a great way to um, make your presentation really nice. Okay, time to check in with these. Nope, they're not ready yet. Okay. So in addition to the corn, I thought um, some fresh pea pods would go nicely with this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut them two different ways. I'm going to cut them, some of them, into long strips like so. And then the rest, I'm going to cut just a, a thin slice. So I'll make some more strips, just taking my knife. And I'm not going to cook these. I'm actually going to put these on the dish raw. They have a beautiful flavor. They add a nice crunchy note to the dish. I'm sorry, did I? I said, did you buy this knife? Oh. <laughs> um, no, but funny you should say that. Um, I'm actually headed to Japan next month. And I'm going to be looking for the site um, for some cooking classes. So who's going to join me in Japan for a class? Anybody? <laughs> Maybe the library would would charter a plane 
take us all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, food destination travel paired with some cooking classes is really popular right now, and I'm just. I just want to be a part of it. I love the idea of traveling to a destination, exploring their local produce, uh, grains, and cooking with what they have to offer, what the region is known for. So I'm actually headed to a mushroom farm next month. And I'm hoping, whoops, that we can work out an arrangement where I can teach some classes there. So fingers crossed. Uh, Japan, the Nagano area, if you know, it's um, like right at the base of the mountains. Beautiful area. It's where they held the uh, Winter Olympics back in maybe 98, something like that. So, oh, that's right. You guys can see. Can you see the beautiful uh, grid on them? Yeah. By cutting them, you help, um, you also let a little bit more flavor get in there, but it also looks really beautiful, so. No, I just chopped them really finely, and they'll be delicious. In the pan, um, maybe two teaspoons of, of oil. And I do use avocado oil when I use oil. It's my favorite oil for many reasons, um, primarily because it will tolerate very high heat without breaking down. And the other thing is that the flavor is very neutral. It doesn't um, take away from or disrupt the dish. You can use it in you know, baking, something sweet, and then of course, you know, anything savory. So, it's, it's what I use. I know a lot of people use olive oil. I used it for years, but I got tired of it. I know a lot of people don't feel that way, but um, I just, yeah, just had enough of it. And this is actually better to use for, um, for frying. Okay, those are nearly done. So the base of our dish is going to be polenta. So sometimes just for fun, I'll do internet searches for recipes, just curious how other people make things. I'm not a recipe person myself. I only, for these classes, I have to write down what's in my head. <laughs> and sometimes that's painful, but, um, uh, but I, sometimes I get curious how other people do things. So I was looking at polenta recipes, and I couldn't believe it. Every single recipe that I found online tells you to boil your liquid and slowly add your cornmeal or your polenta in, which is cor chunky cornmeal. Um, and then just basically keep whisking and hoping that you don't get big clumps in it. Doesn't work that well. Um, I've come up with a different way to do it that makes it much easier. So um, what you want to do is start with everything cold and whisk that cornmeal into your cold liquid. And you can do it right in your pan before you put the pan on the stove. Whisk it all together when it's cold, and then put it on the heat, continue stirring, and you'll get beautiful polenta. I, I did not see a single recipe that, to me, it's, I was very surprised. No? Does it get clumpy? No? Okay. Oh, okay. I know you can buy the kind like in the plastic tube um, and add those to a pan with some liquid and slowly break up you know, the clump. Um, and that works okay. 
But if you want to make it from scratch, I really recommend this method. Um, the other thing with polenta is it doesn't always have a lot of flavor, and I want, I want it to be full flavor. So I did some things to give it some flavor. I, um, I started off with broth instead of just plain water. And then uh, I used the not chicken broth again. And I, um, I put some onions in there, some fresh onion, and some garlic, and some pepper, and some corn kernels. So for this recipe, you could reserve some of the corn from your corn on the cob if you want. Um, or if you like me, you probably always have a bag of frozen organic <laughs> corn. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> uh, corn in the freezer. Is there a bird in here? Okay. <laughs> Sure, absolutely. Yeah, risotto's very similar. The main thing is you just, you want something with a little texture and you want something to anchor your little scallops. So this was made ahead and reheated, so it's not as velvety smooth as it would be if I had uh, cooked it in front of you here. And it also looks chunky because it's full of onions and corn. So don't judge me. It's not clumpy, I promise. <laughs> it looks yellowy. Is it the clumpy thing? Um, well, it's 100% cornmeal. So just yellow from the, the cornmeal. So polenta is just cornmeal that's uh, more co coarsely ground. And that's fine, but I actually... Um, put mine in the blender and made it more finely ground. And I should have just bought cornmeal from the start, but anyway, I bought polenta, ground it down. It cooks faster and makes a smoother uh, finish. They're all pretty similar. Yeah. And the way you cook them, the way you flavor them, just all pretty much the different versions of the same thing. All right, so we've got polenta. So if you're doing, having this, um, you know, just making an entree, you can just put, you know, take an individual dinner plate and do this. And now what I'm going to do is just make it pretty. So we eat with our eyes first, right? So I'm just going to take these little scallops and let me put a big one in the middle first. So you can cook these without doing the boiling step, but I don't know if I finished my thought earlier, but I like to cook them this way. I like the texture of them after they've been cooked a bit. Um, and I like the, the uh, flavor infusion they get from the broth. So now I'm going to use these strips of corn, maybe build them up like so. Can't have too much corn. I think we need to move that one. There we go. And I don't want these corn kernels to go to waste. Let's put those on there. Okay, and then these little strips of the pea pods. 
just make this look beautiful. Kind of rushing this season, but this would be a nice um, summer dish with some fresh corn, fresh peas. Those two just want to stick up. Well, let's see. <laughs> Come on. There we go. How does it look on that side? I can't see the far side. Looks okay? Oh, we're not done yet. <laughs> There's more. So this needs a little sauce. So I've paired it with a horseradish sauce. Did you know that horseradish is counts as a cruciferous veggie. For those of you trying to eat a serving of cruciferous uh, veg every day. So some days if you're just not feeling the broccoli or Brussels sprouts or cauliflower, you can, um, you can have a teaspoon of horseradish. <laughs> but in sauce or... <laughs> so I'm just going to drizzle this And if you decide to do this, and I hope you do, um, be careful when you buy horseradish. A lot of it very surprisingly contains egg. Egg. Um, yeah. Egg and horseradish, yeah. There's just. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, read the labels. It's kind of surprising. So let's finish this off with the rest of our peas. I want there to be enough so that every bite you have has that little crunch of the pea in it. And then you can't have too many onions in your life. Okay, there we go. Now I'm done. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. How is it served? Well, I've used a serving platter, but um, when I was experimenting at home, I just do this on a dinner plate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, by the time I finished developing a recipe, I, my family right now is saying, okay, no more scallop mushrooms. <laughs> they're my built-in uh, guinea pigs. Um, it, yeah, it is. So um, less if you don't like the bite of uh, horseradish or more if you do enjoy it. So it turns out it's quite good for you. So we'll put that one there. Let's see. How many people have heard about some of the health benefits of mushrooms? Yeah, they're pretty amazing uh, things. They are well considered to have, uh, you know, to be a great bo boost to the immune system. Um, years ago, I used to teach cooking classes at one of the local cancer care centers. And the nutritionists there would always tell me to um, 
mushrooms, teach people how to get more mushrooms in their diets because you know, there are a lot of studies that would support um, that they really help your body defend itself. I'm not going to give you medical advice, but I can just tell you that uh, I did that for several years, and that was the one thing on repeat is get people to eat more mushrooms. Um, there's plenty of information out there. If you'd like to learn more, I uh, encourage you to... Uh, do some research. I know uh, mushroom coffee is having a moment right now. Have any of you tried that? <laughs> it's quite popular. Um, not for me, but <laughs> I would rather eat the mushrooms. But um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to um, enjoy mushrooms and get the, the health benefits that they offer. Um, well, it's hard to go wrong, but there are certain varieties that do um, have more of the immune boosting um, element in them. There's, we actually have a special guest today I was saving him for a surprise, but maybe I will mention that he's here now. We actually have Jim from Canyon Creek Mushroom Farm, a local grower of mushrooms. Everybody's looking, where is he? Where is he? <laughs> there he is. Um, yay! But um, he's the expert, so if you have any questions for him afterwards, um, He's also going to speak a little bit, um, if I can hopefully get my, my food done. But, um, and he can tell you more about um, certain mushrooms and, and all of that. He's the expert. Um, lost my train of thought, but uh, yeah. I'll put this other dish together, and then we can get um, Jim to come up and tell us a little bit about how he grows mushrooms in the desert. I'm headed to the mountains of Japan in a couple of weeks to uh, look at uh, mushrooms growing, but he can actually pull it off here in the desert, so pretty cool. Okay, so moving on from the forest scallops. So for this next dish, well, let me back up a little bit. I actually use three different varieties of mushrooms for the marinated mushrooms. Um, beach mushrooms, um, button mushrooms, what was the third one? Oh, some cremini. Um, so the recipe will, it can handle any mushroom. I think I even threw a few oyster mushrooms in here. But the next dish I'm going to use features the oyster mushrooms. And I was able to get some beautiful mushrooms from Jim at Canyon Creek. Um, I bought two different colors. I was able to get these beautiful pinkish ones. And then these, which are, you see these more often in the, you know, in the regular stores. But I've used both kinds of oysters in this dish. And I've done the same cooking um, process. I've cooked them and the tofu. I added some tofu to this dish in a very um, well-seasoned broth. And so again, just kind of infuses the mushroom with flavor and makes it nice and tender, so it was very easy to put on a skewer. So what I'm going to do, I've done the, most of the cooking at home, but I'm going to just plate this up, give you a suggestion of how you could serve this. So I've got, I have some rice here. Um, yes, this is some 
organic jasmine rice. And I'm just going to make these nice little scoops. So once I cooked the mushrooms in the broth and gave them some time to cool down a bit, I trimmed them up a little bit. The base of the oyster mushrooms, let me break one off here. The base of it is a little chewy. Um, the, the top part of it is a little bit more tender. So I chose to just trim the base off of the ones that I used on these shish kebabs. I also have some beautiful bok choy. Let's see. And I grilled some pineapple rings. Let's see here. I'm doing this sideways and backwards. Pay attention to what I'm doing here. <laughs> They're canned. I didn't have it in me to trim down a pineapple and make perfect little rings, so. <laughs> Sometimes it's okay to cheat. Um, I fried them, actually, yeah, just to get them brown around the edges. There's no sugar. No sugar. The natural sugar in the pineapple um, helps them brown nicely. Ah, I'm glad you brought that up. I actually meant to talk about that early on and I forgot. So thank you for asking me about um, how do you clean a mushroom. She actually used the word wash. Um, I don't want you to wash them. What I want you to do is take them and my favorite method, you can buy brushes, there's different things available, but I just like a damp, to have a damp dishcloth and just wipe any little spots of dirt that you see on it off. Um, they're very porous, so if you immerse them in water, they'll soak up the water. And it's not the end of the world, but what happens to your mushroom? It tastes like water. Yeah. Um, so my first tip for buying mushrooms in the store, so if you go someplace like Jim's, you don't have to worry about dirty mushrooms. But if you're just quickly grabbing some in your local grocery store, they're probably in a package. Look for the cleanest ones you can find. It's not fun to sit here and you know, do this to each of them. So if they're really dirty, I won't buy them. But look for a very clean package and just carefully wipe, wipe them down with a damp cloth. The other thing when you're buying those prepackaged mushrooms, you want to make sure the cap doesn't have any brown spots starting on it. And then the other thing is hopefully it's packaged in a way that you can see the underside. But you want to buy, for the, the most common mushrooms that we most of us buy, the, uh, the button mushrooms, the cremini, you don't want those caps on those mushrooms to be opening up. You don't want them, the cap separated from the stem. Um, a lot of times I notice the prepackaged ones in the store, they'll have them, the bottoms all facing down so that you can't tell. But it's a sign of freshness. As they age, that cap starts to come away from the stem. So when you're choosing mushrooms, that sort of mushroom, you know, it's certainly not true for one of these because, yeah, kind of a non-issue with this guy. But, um, but the typical store bought the little ones in the packages. No brown spots and caps closed. How, well. When the cap has started to come apart from the stem and shows the gills on the underneath, it's old. And when the brown spots start on top, on the cap, it's old. And they should be firm. That's my tip for this. If I can't see the bottom. It'll be firm and smooth with no brown mushy spots. And also sometimes you open them, they are a little slimy. Yeah, you don't want slimy mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, but next time, if you have to buy out of a package, um, make sure there's no brown spots and try and get a look at the underside of the mushroom to see if the cap is still firmly closed. And that'll mean it's fresh. Right? Sure. What's the best way to store them? Once you've opened the, the store bought, not the item that you just stored in a bag, it's perfect. <laughs> 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 but from the store, the, like a white button mushroom or whatever, what's the best way to store the ones that aren't loose yet? Well, those will really dry out if you don't keep them covered. So, and they also get yeah, what I usually do is, <laughs> and I don't, maybe Jim may have some better advice for us, but what I do is I'll put them in a different container with um, like a paper towel underneath yeah. and then close it to keep them from drying out. And that seems to work for me. But you you have have many <laughs> Sorry, I think. Yeah. But they're enclosed and that seems to work for me. Mm -hmm. But you can't yeah. use them within like seven Right. Days. They'll still dry out that way. Yeah, if you're gonna use them in a day or two, that's a great way. In fact, I, I when I can't go to Canyon Creek, um, sometimes in the store you can buy them, they're loose or bulk and they have little paper bags there. If I buy them that way, I will keep them in that paper bag. So yeah. Someone else? Um, okay, um, I do keep them in the fridge. You buy them cold, so that tells you that they need to be kept cold. Um, what was the second question? <laughs> oh, same, same method. There aren't any mushrooms that I immerse in water or run under the tap. Um, I always just wipe them down. If the stem is fresh and nice, I use it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sometimes um, as they start to age a little bit, they'll, from the bottom of the stem up, they'll get a little yucky and I might trim that off. But if it's nice and fresh, I use the stems as well. But sometimes hmm. we are more sometimes something else mm -hmm. and are not so easy to clean. Because well, we are soft and mm -hmm. they're know, fragile. fragile. Yeah, fragile. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just inspect them. If there's anything on there that, you know, shouldn't be damp cloth or a dry cloth, just gently wipe them. Yeah. Yes, I do. Um, that's another great question. Another um, easy to find mushroom out there is the portobello. Um, I, when I have someone tell me they don't like the taste of mushrooms, I always suspect that they've eaten a portobello with the gills left on. <laughs> it's, some people enjoy it, but I think most people do not enjoy the uh, kind of swampy flavor that, that that adds to your mushroom. But yeah, you just hold them upside down in your hand like so, and you take a spoon, and you can just easily scrape the gills off of the portobello. All right, so here is our teriyaki dish. I think I tell you on there just to use three cups of chopped veggies. Um, just use your favorites. I use zucchini, onion, bell pepper, the pea pods, and some bok choy and pineapple. Just get creative, but make it colorful because remember, the different colors in the produce represent different nutrients. So if you eat a colorful meal, you're giving your body the variety of nutrients that it needs. So. Sure. Uh, 
I cooked them on skewers. Yeah. Um, I alternated the tofu with um, each color of the oyster mushroom. Gonna add some green onion on here. Um, ah, and I meant to bring sesame seeds, I forgot. But uh, yeah, I cooked them this way. And then I think I wrote a note on there, or I intended to write a note, that if you don't feel like going through the whole shish kebab hassle, you can also just cook these ingredients in your pan. Make it, you know, make life easier. But I think the shish kebabs are a really nice presentation if you, you know, for a special occasion, if you have company or something. So how am I doing on time? Okay, sure. Yeah, more mushrooms, a variety. Maybe alternate with something different. Oh, are you, I'm sorry, are you talking about tofu or are you talking about soy sauce? Oh, yeah, tofu, yeah. Ah, yeah, more mushrooms or you could add veggies too. I just kept mine kind of plain and simple. Um, but there's, there you go, there's an idea for a teriyaki mushroom and tofu. <laughs> So now I, I'm kind of proud of myself. I'm actually not running late, which I'm not sure that's ever happened before. <laughs> um, I want to introduce our guest, Jim. He is the owner of Canyon Creek Mushrooms. I'm glad some of you are already familiar with him um, or with the business. They supply a lot of local restaurants with these beautiful mushrooms. They sell them at farmer's markets. And then they also have, you know, the wonderful warehouse in Palm Desert where they grow these is open, I believe, six days a week. Yep, and you can go and take a tour. <laughs> and it's in Palm Desert. But um, Jim, do you want to come on up? So. Hello, everyone. So I want to say the questions I heard you guys ask were wonderful questions. Feel free to ask them again at the end of the presentation. I'm happy to stick around and answer them. So one of the questions we get asked most often is, how, well, how are you able to grow mushrooms in the desert? Well, the obvious answer is we have to do it indoors. <clears throat> but most, I think, people, when they imagine a mushroom farm, they picture long fields of dirt, mushrooms growing up out of the dirt and being harvested that way. Well, the strategy we use is a little different. The type of mushroom we grow is very important. We grow what we refer to as the tree-based mushrooms. So if you ever to go out into nature and forage for these type of mushrooms, you have to look up to see them. If you look down, you're going to walk right underneath them. And what, what we're able to do then is we grow them on trees, but in, in our sense, the trees are sawdust. We bring sawdust in from the mills in the northeast, and that's what the mycelium you see here eats, and then it gives us the mushrooms. The other advantage of that is we can grow them vertically. If you ever come out to the farm for a tour, we'll show you all around, and you'll see that in addition to having a lot of square footage for growing, we grow up on tall shelves, as my crew will attest, because they're up and down ladders all day long. Um, so what you see here, the block here, is the, the, the medium on which we grow. This is basically just sawdust and water, which the white mycelium has consumed, and when it's consumed all the energy in the sawdust, it produces the mushrooms, we harvest the mushrooms. And you can see we get these big, beautiful clusters of mushrooms. And the nice thing about mycelium is it wants to do it again. So we're able to put the block right back in the room. We'll get a second harvest out of it. And we can get a third and a fourth because that's the way mycelium works. As long as it has fresh food, it'll keep going. That's why if you're ever foraging for mushrooms out in nature, you find them in the same spot over and over and over again. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I don't want to steal all your stuff, no, but no, no, I, you no. Know, I encourage everybody to come out to the farm if you can. We love, love, love giving tours. We love talking about it. Because everybody, including myself, is new to this. We've learned it on our own, and we love sharing that experience with everybody else. Yeah, I was there yesterday to pick up the mushrooms I was going to use today, and just that short time I was there, you had three different groups come in for tours. So it's a busy, exciting place. So I encourage you to check it out. Um, we're off of uh, Washington Street in Palm Desert, just north of the highway. And if you Google Canyon Creek mushrooms, hopefully it comes up first. <laughs> yes? Just wondering, what's the maturity of those trees? How long does it take for them to get that long? 
Excellent question. The mushrooms grow very fast. On our farm, we harvest twice a day because if we harvest once a day, we wouldn't get them at their peak freshness. So what happens is once the block is ready to produce mushrooms, we cut the block open and that's how the mushrooms come out. In about 10 days, we'll see the little baby mushrooms appear. Four days later, they look like this. You could literally sit there and watch them grow. So you sell those kits, right? If someone yes, wants we to actually, do this at home? I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. we actually sell these blocks ready to fruit. So if you wanted to try it at home, you can. And as long as you can keep the humidity, which is the important part in the desert, at the right levels, you can do this as well. But I caution people, be ready. Because when these <laughs> grow, you have to have a plan for three pounds of mushrooms. <laughs> what is the name of the farm again? Canyon Creek Mushrooms. Canyon? Canyon Creek Mushrooms, yes. And we're off of Washington in Palm Desert. Oh. Do you have any scheduled tours? I'll appear right there. Sorry? No, it's, it's drop-in. Um, if you're coming with a big group of people, you might want to call ahead. Uh, so we won't have groups collide, but yeah, just walk in anywhere from 10 to 4, Monday to Saturday. Yes? Yes, congratulations. <laughs> How would you start something like this? As far as trying to grow your own and creating your own cultures? If you come to the farm, I can show you. Do you need a mother or something? No. So there's an interesting, there's an interesting characteristic about mycelium that um, although I could trap the spores that come up from the gills and use that to start a new colony and get more mushrooms, Mycelium is fascinating in the sense that I can actually take a piece of the mushroom tissue itself and start a new colony from that. It's almost like cloning, not quite cloning, but I don't need a seed or a spore to start it. Yes? Um, we're at Wildcat in Washington. Near the 10. Yeah, so if you Google Canyon Creek mushrooms, the map takes you right to our doorstep. Are you at certain farmers markets? We're at all the farmers markets, okay. including the one here in Rancho Mirage on Friday. Um, you can see our schedule on our website, but all the markets in the valley were, were attended. Yes? I would like to try to grow one of those, but what would be the best month for me to try to grow it here? So you have to control both temperature and humidity, so there's no good month here in the desert. So <laughs> any month will work. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah, so we often say and you, you want to take it in a space where it's easier to control the humidity, so not necessarily out in the living spaces where the air currents are pushing the humidity all the time. Wow. That's <laughs> plan B, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. So um, we, we provide uh, a cheesecloth with our kits. The cheesecloth helps. If you keep the cheesecloth wet, it'll keep the mushrooms wet. Um, but other than that, just a humidification room. It doesn't have to be like super wet, but anything above, you want to get it about 70% pretty consistently, which can be a challenge in the desert. Uh, one of the questions that was asked is about cleanliness and how to clean the mushrooms. And what the chef said was spot on. But you'll notice our mushrooms look super clean because literally it's sawdust and water. So if you do happen to see a speck on my mushroom, it's a piece of sawdust. Wipe it if you wish. Flick it off if you have to. If you eat it, it's not going to hurt you. So. <laughs> nice. I forgot. I'm actually curious what your best-selling mushrooms are. Do you no, have a best-selling? Yeah. So the best-selling mushroom we have at Canyon Creek is the lion's mane. Oh. It's a delicious mushroom. Are you cooking it? I swear today? I didn't know. <laughs> I just picked this up. Um, I'm, I'm not going to, but I, f I forgot to tell them why. But uh, A couple of reasons. One, it's a delicious mushroom. Well, a couple of... Uh, not, it, so it, it, people just enjoy eating it as a, as a mushroom. Another reason lion's mane is popular is it doesn't have a very strong mushroom flavor. So if that kind of thing isn't your cup of tea, you can still use the mushroom for the benefits. It's easy to season this and flavor it to, to whatever flavor you're um, pursuing. The most popular recipe for the lion's mane is a vegan crab cake, where the lion's mane substitutes the crab meat, but because it's so easy to season, you don't know you're, not, you're eating a mushroom. It, it's uh, very similar to the meat itself. The other thing I'd like to do with the lion's mane is to make a steak with it. Um, what I would do is 
It turns out the best in a cast iron pan, and cast iron is like too heavy and too hot for my little cooktop here. So that's why I decided not to do it. But if any of you would like to try this at home, what I would do is maybe have this, and then I would put it in a hot skillet with a weight on it. And if you have two different sizes of cast iron pans, you could just use that second pan on top. And what you're going to do is just cook it until it flattens down to the thickness that you want. This is a cast iron, it's actually a burger press, but uh, has never been used for a burger. Um, but it's a great mushroom press. So I cook them down in a hot cast iron pan, um, flip it, and I wait for all of that moisture to cook out. The press helps, helps it release the moisture. So once that moisture is out of it, then it's time to flavor it. And a really simple, easy way is to just, um, once you're at that state, you can put some barbecue sauce in your pan, coat it well, and then just crisp it up on the edges. And it's absolutely delicious with some mashed potatoes and some vegetables. It's just a beautiful, easy, very healthy meal. But, uh, Health benefits. That's the third reason lion's mane is so popular. In addition to having the nutritional benefits that all mushrooms have, the lion's mane has been described as having additional benefits that include a cognitive uh, benefit of the brain, has some anti-inflammatory uh, characteristics that I can attest to myself, uh, some anti-anxiety properties, and just an overall energy boost. That's why you see it like you were mentioning the mud water coffee. Um, lion's mane is always a staple in those kind of supplements. In fact, uh, at Canyon Creek, we actually offer our own powders and capsules for that reason. Yes? Good question. Because they're tree-based mushrooms, they expect light. So at our farm, it's 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Uh, they don't, there's no photosynthesis, so they don't need the light. But without the light, they get confused and they start growing out on all different directions. But with the light, they always grow up. Truffles are mushrooms, but they're a little different. Yes. Where these are uh, decomposers because they break down tree matter, truffles have a symbiotic relationship with the tree root. As long as the tree is healthy, the truffle will be healthy. Yes? Um, on the topic of lion's mane, what are the uh, cancer benefits and which mushrooms I always encourage people to do their own research because this, this isn't like the FDA and they're running experiments. That being said, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that the turkey tail, turkey tail has some anti-cancer properties. It is, a, it is a tree mushroom, but interestingly enough, you can't consume it. It's like tree bark. You have to grind it up and take it as a supplement. You could never cook with it. Yes. Mayataki as well, I believe. And reishi. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it should mostly um, blend into the drink, and you, you'll notice it might alter the flavor a little bit, especially like if you're making a tea. Completely disappears in food. There's no wrong place to put the powder if you're trying to get it into your system, so whatever works easiest for you. I've had people dose it into their salad dressing because they do a salad every day. That's how they choose to do it. But also, there should be some enzymes if you're on a diet. Shouldn't. Shouldn't. What? what but we have actually discovered having a mushroom farm here in the desert that certain people are discovering that they have an unknown or unrecognized mushroom sensitivity. Now that mushrooms are available, they discover, hey, maybe it's not for me, and it usually manifests in the tummy. Excuse me. <laughs> Didn't mean to block him. Yes. Let's see. Would you guys like to try some coconut aminos? It's a wonderful substitute for soy sauce. There are, in general, there are no significantly flavor. poisonous mushrooms in the <laughs> desert. Okay. That being said, there's no significantly edible mushrooms in the like desert either. Would you like some bouillon cubes? So it's best, always best. Enjoy. Even I do Actually, not eat like mushrooms I forage terrica? unless it's an obvious one like a cremini or a morel. It's just not worth the risk. Oh, yes. Would you like some tarragon? Good question. Uh, at Canyon Creek, Enjoy. every mushroom we grow fresh has a secondary use 
if it goes beyond no. its freshness date. Oh, and that's some okay. of it goes into our jerky, some of it into our dry products, some of it into our powders, but it can you quickly have no waste. Do you like some bouillon cubes? Yeah. So as a rule, a Welcome. mushroom will remain <laughs> relatively fresh for about 14 days, but it's really dependent on the temperature that you're storing it at. The sweet spot for mushroom for longevity is 34 degrees. You don't want to go below that because you risk freezing, which will destroy the mushroom. And as you get up away from 44 degrees or 34 degrees, you start to lose some of that time. So at Canyon Creek, the mushrooms that you buy from us have not have been or harvested less than five days ago. Typically three days, sometimes the same day. But that gives you a good solid week at home to take advantage of that peak freshness. Over time in your fridge, you'll see them start to dry out. We send them home to you in a paper bag. We talked about paper being the right way to store it. That helps prolong it, but given time, they will completely dehydrate right there in your fridge. We do dry mushrooms, yes. We offer them dried or they go into our jerky. And once they're dried, they're pretty shell stable. The only thing you have to really worry about a dried mushroom is if you have a humid home, eventually this will start to, like a sponge, absorb the humidity, which will shorten its life. No? There you go. Mushroom? Between you and my little mushroom doubt at this point in my life. <laughs> that being said, um, I'm, I'm all over the map. Like, the lion's mane is always a good go to. I cube it up like a chicken, saute it, and I can have it with anything. The trumpets, I'm not a, a great chef, but it, there's a vegan um, pulled pork recipe where they use the trumpet as the pork. Super simple. You just take a fork to the stem, mix it in some barbecue sauce, throw it in the oven. Comes out like pulled pork. Yeah, they shred really well. It's so versatile. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, and Everybody. I'll be around afterwards. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. thank you for coming. Hope to see you next month. Uh, April 9th, I'll be back. Oh, absolutely, yeah.